So we've been talking about Am I Like Job? And uh, talking about the different Job factors that um, we've unfortunately incorporated into Christian belief and into our belief systems as believers and has kept us hindered and not experiencing the very life of God that is within us. You need to remember that when God created you, you know, an inventor starts with an idea. So any inventor, he first starts with a thought in his head, with an idea in his head. And you were God's very first intention and thought to think that everything that God did was for you because he wanted a relationship with you. That you were God's very, very first idea. That's how much value he had. Everything that God has ever done is that he has done it so that you would believe in his love for you. Everything that he has done. And religion has clouded our thought and has clou clouded our minds concerning who God is and who we are. Now Job, there's so many misunderstandings in Job and people want to take scriptures out of Job not understanding who God is and not understanding the finished work of the cross of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us. So it is true that Job said, it is the Lord who gives and it is the Lord who takes away. It is true that Job said it, but what Job said is not true. Shall I say that again? It is true that Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but it is not true what Job said. Because God doesn't take away. He is the author of life. And any reference, and we quoted the stats last week concerning gives and takes away, and all of the references to God taking away is talking about taking away your sin, taking away death, taking away poverty, taking away sickness. So when God takes away, he's taking away something that is going to harm you. He's never going to take something away from you. And many people, when they go to a funeral, it's like, no, God took this person. No, God didn't take anybody. Hello? Very quiet all of a sudden. So we looked at our first Sunday evening. The first factor that Job had to deal with was fear. Job said that in Job 3 verse 25. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come unto me. In Job chapter 1, we looked through a whole bunch of scriptures there. He feared losing his family and his possessions. In Job chapter 1 verse 21, he feared for his own life. And we looked through that whole portion of scripture that God didn't turn Job over to the devil, but it was God's statement. He said to, to the devil, I see that you have already set your heart upon Job. And the reason why the devil could have influence into Job's life was because of what Job believed. Because he'd opened his heart, heart up because of fear. And because of what he feared in his heart, that is what came to pass. See, you have been created in the very image of God. So you have been created to believe like God believes. And God is a, a heart God. So everything that God does comes from the inside of who He is. And you have been created in His image. So you function in the same way. You function based on a belief in your heart. That is why it says in Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else that you guard, for out of it flow the issues of life. So everything in my life flows out of a belief that I have in my heart. Now, if I have a fearful belief, if I am believing, what does fear mean? An acronym is false evidence appearing real. So if I'm believing in something which has not happened yet, as though it has or is, that's what I'm going to experience. And the opposite of fear is love. Because perfect love casts out all fear. And it's in the environment of God's love where faith and hope come alive in me. Because I believe because I can trust God. Because He is trustworthy. And I've seen that in the environment of God there is no fear of torment, torment or punishment. So because my heart is established in love, I can have faith. And I can have hope. What is hope? A confident expectation of good. So that is why we need to resist fear. A false expectation that is appearing real. 
We have to resist fear. And the Bible says, if you have fear, it shows that your heart has not been made perfect in love. We attract what we believe. Say amen. So it's so important that you get your heart established in what Christ accomplished for you. When your heart gets established in that, you will attract what you believe in your heart. In Job 1.21, this is what Job said. Naked came I out of, my, out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The, the, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was very confused. He was sincere, but he was sincerely confused. Job 2.10, he says, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? So he believed that whatever came his way was from God. Whether it be good or evil, it was all God. And you know, there are many Christians who believe that. They believe that if evil or hardship comes their way, well, it must be God trying to teach me a lesson. And we looked in the first session of J in James 1, verse 13 and 14. It says, let no man say when he is being tempted, tested, tried, scrutinized, experiencing a hard time that it is God. Because God does not tempt, test, try, scrutinize, or give a hard time to any man. Because God cannot be tempted, tested, tried by any evil. So God will never be complicit to any evil in your life. And he goes on in James 1.16. It says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So every good thing that is, you've ever experienced in your life has been God. And every bad thing has not been God. Jesus said it in John 10. I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. It is the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we can never, ever confuse the, the two like Job did. By believing when you are experiencing some sort of turmoil or hardship, when you are going through a trial or a tribulation, which we all go through. Jesus also made that promise, in this world you'll have tribulation. So even when I'm going through that, I know that I can run to God. What does it say in Corinthians about temptation and trial? It says, whenever you experience a temptation, God is faithful who always provides the way of escape. It's not God is guilty. So it's so important that you get your heart established in the good news, in the gospel, that God is a good father. Not 90% good, like I said this morning, with a big red button that's waiting to be pushed. In Matthew 4.24, take heed what you hear. With the measure that you meet, it will be measured back to you, and that which you hear, shall be, more shall be even given. So he's saying what you meditate on, what you ponder on, what you think about concerning God, even that which you're pondering on will come back to you. So if you're pondering on the wrong thing, People are looking at TV, and people are listening to the radio, and they're reading books, and fear is entering into their hearts, and they're meditating on it, and they're thinking about the future of what, might, what bad things might happen, and the more they ponder on it, the more they think on it, guess what happens? Jesus said this in, in Mark 1 verse 15, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Now, when I was growing up um, in a legalistic environment as a Christian, whenever we heard repent, it was repent from your sins. But Jesus never said that. John the Baptist said that. John the Baptist said repent for your sins. Jesus says repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the good news. We all need to do a lot of repenting. And we do need to do a whole lot of believing of the good news. That's what the word gospel there means, good news. In 1 John, or 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Hebrews 2.15 in the New Living Translation, Only in becoming a human and dying could Jesus deliver those who lived all their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Jesus has delivered us from that fear. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. He that fears has not been made perfect in love. 
So we, we spoke about fear, that fear will restrict you. That's why we need to resist all fear in regarding our relationship with God and regarding our relationships with people. Fear of rejection. Fear of not being accepted or liked. We need to resist that and live out of the affirmation that because I'm in perfect love, I don't need your acceptance. Do I want it? Yes. Do I need it? No. See, there's a big difference. I'm not living for that. It's nice to have, but even if I don't have it, there is somebody called my Heavenly Father who loves me perfectly. And I was His original thought and intent. Amen. And then last week, we believe, we just went through some of the New Testament, Testament beliefs concerning um, the devil. That the devil can no longer curse you because if God has blessed you, you cannot be cursed. And that is the, the way of Balaam and the era of Balaam. That the way of Balaam was, I'm going to curse what God has blessed. And he says, no, that's an error. You cannot curse what God has blessed. And Ephesians 1, it says that you are blessed in him. And then the, the, the era of Balaam is talking about merchandising the anointing or trying to make profit out of the gospel. There's error in that. And that God has never, ever, since the resurrection, has not heard one bad thing about you. He has not heard one bad thing about you. That God dealt with the accuser 2,000 years ago. So there is no longer an accusation in the heavens between you and God. There might be an accusation in your own mind, but there is no longer an accusation in heaven because Jesus, by his blood, has purged heaven of all sin. So you stand before God, holy and righteous, with a big sign that says, not guilty. Not guilty because you have an advocate who is making intercession for you. His name is Jesus. So we stand before him in our true identity as powerful, spirit-led, redeemed, forgiven, accepted children of God. Yet we live the opposite because we don't believe it. That's why Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. Because it takes effort on our part, we have to labor to enter into rest. We, it takes effort to renew our minds and to repent. So tonight I want to talk about our confession because our confession helps our heart stay in a position where we have turned to God and are experiencing who He is and renewing our minds to who we are. There is a negative confession and there is a positive confession. What is coming out of your mouth? Your confession reveals your heart. But your confession has the power to change your heart. What did Jesus, he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you'll find out quickly what you believe about something by what comes out of your mouth. And you can catch yourself and you can change a belief system by using your confession. In James chapter 3, verses 2 to 10, it's a long, eight verses, it's quite long, but let's read it together. It says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Now, you've got to just stop and think about it. It says it so wonderfully in the Message Bible, but we're not going to read it tonight. But he's saying, even in the midst of trial, storm, tribulation, and opposition, you can still direct a ship to its destination by a small rudder, your tongue. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Those are strong words. That you can experience hell on earth by what is coming out of your mouth. Now, 
he's, he's not only talking about what are you saying about circumstances, he's saying wh- what are you saying about yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you say? For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Now Job had many negative confessions. You need to watch what is coming out of your mouth. In Job 1.5, this is some of his negative confessions. It may be that my children have sinned and will die. Guess what happened? His children sinned and they died. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Because of his mixed up, screwed up belief system, guess what happened? God didn't take anything. Remember, there was the devil. It set his heart on him. In that portion in Job, it actually says that God had placed a hedge about him, and Satan recognized that, and God didn't deny it. In Job 2 verse 10, shall we receive only good and not evil from the Lord? In in Job chapter 3, it says, cursed is the day I was born. That's what Job said. Then you know what happened in Job. For the next 30 odd years, chapters, his friends came to try and figure this one out with him, with no concept of who God was. Job was the first book of the Bible. It's the oldest book of the Bible, Job. So they'd had no reference in terms of a relationship with God, nothing. So they were trying to figure it out carnally. Some of the things his friends said in Job 4 verses 7 to 8, this is in the New Living Translation. Innocent people do not perish. When has an upright person been destroyed? Job 5, verses 1 to 6. You may cry for help, but no one listens. You may turn to the angels, but they give you no help. Job 4, verses 4 to 6. Job Job 8, verse 4 to 6. Your children obviously sinned against him, so their punishment was well deserved. Now, you know this. Unfortunately, there are Christians who believe that. They believe that if you sin, God is going to punish you. Do you know that? That's what people, some Christians believe. Do you believe that? God punished Jesus so that you would never have to be punished. But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the mighty, if you're pure and live with complete integrity, he will rise up and restore your happy home. <laughs> now, confession means acknowledgement. The Hebrew word confession, it means acknowledgement or to say the same thing as it comes from the the hebrew and in the greek it's homo logos which means to confess the same thing as or to acknowledge the same thing as so my confession needs to acknowledge the same thing as god in proverbs 18 verses 21 death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof and i love it in the message bible words Satisfy the mind. So he sa- that's, a, that's a clue there. Well, it's a key. Words satisfy the mind. So your words can speak to your mind and satisfy your thoughts. What is coming out of your mind, out of your mouth? Words satisfy the mind as much as fruit does the stomach. Good talk is as gratifying as a good harvest. Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. So my confession and your confession, your acknowledgement of who who you are in Christ and of who God is, how good he is, needs to be consistent with who he really is. Words will empower your belief system. In Matthew 12. I'm going to read out the Message Bible. We won't read it out the... New King James. You have minds like a snake pit. What's going on in your thought life, he's asking. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded? 
It's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words season after season. An evil person is a blight on the orchard. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Many times, you need to understand, Jesus said this. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. See, when you are speaking, you're speaking from the heart, from spirit, and it is coming out over your vocal point, uh, vocal cords, but it is spirit that is coming out. So your, your words carry the power of spirit. That is why he's saying you need to understand that your words are powerful because they are empowered by the spirit, by your spirit or by the Holy Spirit. So you need to take cognizance of what is coming out of your mouth. That the very words you are speaking carry weight and carry power. Because they are going to direct your heart and your belief system a certain way. So when you get up in the morning, you know one of the quickest ways to, to catch your heart and to catch your mind from going in a certain direction is to begin to speak. And I had a, an awful dream this past week. I woke up in the morning after having this wicked dream, and, and my heart believed the dream. So how many of you have had a dream where you actually believe that that's what was going to happen? So I woke up with the sense of foreboding in my heart. And the first thing I did when I, when I woke up was I began to speak the word and speak the promises of God and say, no, I resist that in the name of Jesus, and begin to speak the word of God. While it's still dark outside. Because I was not going to go into the day with that sense of foreboding in my heart. A sense of doom. An expectation that bad things are going to happen. So you resist it by speaking the word. Over your own life and over your circumstances. Because if you don't, your heart gravitates and thinks about it the whole day. And you begin to cement a belief in your heart. And then you have an expectation that that which you believe in will come to pass. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25, it says this. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good needs, good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. But he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. So he's giving you a, a clue here. He's saying, let us Hold fast, he talks about, in the Greek there, he's talking about seize it and make it your own. So let us seize and make it our own, the confession of our hope. The confession there is the acknowledgement, or it means to, to uh, again, it's the word homologos, which means to make your own through what you are saying. The confession of our hope. A confident expectation of good. So he's saying here, listen, the way that you're going to be standing without wavering is to make sure that what you are saying, what is coming out of your mouth, is a confident expectation of good things. Hold on to it. Seize it. Make it your own, for God is faithful. He who promised is faithful. What are you saying about yourself? What are you saying about God's promises? What are you saying about who God is? Your confession is powerful. What is coming out of your mouth is powerful. And when we take stock 
and recognize the gravity of the words that come out of our mouth, I think that we would be a lot more careful as to what we declare, what we confess, what we say about ourselves, our lives, our circumstances, our bodies. Do you know that 70% of your body is made up of liquid? And they've taken photographs of water after people have blessed and cursed water. And the photographs of water that has been blessed is beautiful. Snowflakes, beautiful crystals, absolutely beautiful. Water that has been cursed, and a curse has been taped onto that water. It looks like vomit. And your body is made up of 70% liquid. What are you saying about your body? What are you saying about your life? What are you saying about your circumstances? Let me stand to your feet. That was a very quick, very quick 30 minutes. God's encouragement always to us is to repent and believe the gospel. To think that you are God's original thought. Just like an inventor thinks of something and creates it. God thought of you and created you. The Bible says that you are a love poem, his love poem, a work of art. You're a work of art in his eyes. I'm going to ask you to do, like we do every Sunday evening, some heart work. Why don't you just close your eyes and see yourself the way God sees you. The Bible says, as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. What does royalty look like? Do you see yourself standing in front of a mirror and see the Lord Jesus as the Lord of hosts, the captain of captains, the king of kings, the general of generals, the one who is the name above all names? See him standing in front of you and see him looking at you with love and acceptance because when he looks at you, and you look at him, what you beholding is who you are. An overcomer. An overcomer. Because of Christ in you. And if you've been holding on to a thought, if you've been holding on to the past, if you've been holding on to a restriction, tonight is let it go. Send it away and believe the truth that you are God's work of art. He's fearfully and wonderfully made in His image with a great plan and a purpose. That there is nothing that can close in on you because you are more than a conqueror in Him. Greater is He that is in you than He that's in the world. Father, we thank You that we can come to You tonight. And we thank you, Lord, that our confession will be a good confession. That we will hold on to our confession of hope, of a confident expectation of good. Because you are faithful to promises. I thank you that we can declare that we have been chosen in you. That we are redeemed. We are loved and accepted. That fear is foreign. That we are blessed and healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Resist fear. And don't get caught up in the devil's lies, believing that he has access to you when he doesn't. And watch your confession. Begin to confess the right thing about you, yourself, and your life, that you've got a future and a hope. Amen. You are highly favored and deeply loved of God. Father, we thank you for the buri rolls tonight. We thank you that they are blessed to our bodies. Thank you that we can enjoy the food and we can enjoy one another and we can enjoy your presence tonight. In Jesus' name. Bless the hands that have prepared it tonight. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.